Mm-hmm. Now, if you think about parenting a kid who is got really exacerbated ADHD symptoms, and as you said, living in that prolonged stress, um, we're not getting the positive relational experiences. Majority of the time, we're having a really tough um, kind of negative experience, a less desirable parent-child interaction. And so instead of wanting to approach our kids, what happens in our nervous system is we actually start to anticipate the battles and the outbursts and we want to avoid that. And it kind of moves our nervous system into that fight, flight or freeze stress responses. Welcome to the Soaring Child podcast, where parents of children with ADHD learn tips and tricks to help their child soar at home, at school, and in life. We feature interviews with experts, medical professionals, and parents just like you, who are learning how to reduce ADHD symptoms using food and other natural strategies. Because children with ADHD deserve to soar just like every other child. I'm Dana Kay, your host. Hello parents, this is Dana Kay here with another edition of the Soaring Child podcast. Now, before we jump into today's topic, I just want to share a very personal story with you. It's actually a day that I probably will never forget. So I want you to picture this. Uh, It was about 3 p.m. on a cold and rainy Sunday here in Seattle. And we'd been we'd been stuck inside all day long. And the tension in the house was just so thick. You know, those days where everything is getting on your nerves. You know, my son had had multiple meltdowns. Uh, I was snapping at my husband. I was yelling over this and over that. And then and then out of nowhere, my my heart started racing and I started to sort of get these shakes in my body in my hands and and I I couldn't I couldn't catch my breath and I really felt sort of really sick to the stomach and and honestly I was I was terrified of what was going on but it it turns out what I actually experienced was a panic attack and uh I actually don't share it very often but I from that moment on had quite a number of panic attacks. And if you've ever had one, you you know just sort of how overwhelming it feels. And that was the day that was a real wake up call for me. And I and I realized that that something had to change in our home. Now uh, I know that story might resonate with some of you listening today. So today we're, we're diving into a topic that's really close to my heart, that emotional roller coaster of parenting a child with ADHD. You know, we've we've got Ashley Goble with us. She's our resident ADHD child and family therapist. And we're going to chat about how all of those sort of daily ups and downs of ADHD parenting can can really just rattle our nerves. Um, we're going to talk about the, the telltale signs that you as a parent might be getting overwhelmed and, and most importantly, how to take care of yourself in the midst of this whirlwind, I suppose. You know, we're also going to, we're also going to touch on what not to do. You know, those things that might just take the st- Stress and make it even worse. Plus, Ashley's got some amazing tips and tricks, as usual, up her sleeve to help us keep our cool and avoid burning out. Ashley Goble is no stranger to frequent mm-hmm. listeners of the Soaring Child podcast, and we are definitely excited to welcome her back today. So now it's time to welcome Ashley Goble to the Soaring Child. Hi, Ashley. Thank you so much for joining us again today. Hello. Hey, Dana. It's good to be back again. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can resonate with that story that I just shared. Absolutely. I think the first time I, even after the first time I had a panic attack, it literally can feel like you're having a heart attack. You're like, I don't know what's happening. Um, And it often can happen when we actually are calm or things feel like they're okay. And it kind of comes out of nowhere. It can be a little bit confusing. It's just another sign, like you said, of what is going on in our nervous system when we are under prolonged periods of stress. Definitely. And I was under a prolonged 
period of stress. And between you and me, I mean, I felt sick to the stomach, but I actually did end up vomiting. Um, mm. And it was it was awful. And so if there are any listeners out there that have experienced that, you know, know that you're not alone. Uh, parenting a child with, with ADHD can do so much on our own nervous system. It's not just about theirs. And that's why I really am excited to sort of you know, dive into this topic today. Um, so, so Ashley, why don't why don't you start by maybe sharing some signs that you know a parent's nervous system is overwhelmed, you know, and 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 how they they might be able to address that? Yeah. So, um, I wonder. Yeah, I guess I just want to highlight what you've said, Dana, is that parenting a child who is you know, under those daily meltdowns, the emotional outbursts, the aggression, the impulsivity, um, the resistance sometimes to tasks and listening. When, as a parent, when you are constantly experiencing that, it can take a huge toll on our nervous system. Yeah. And you guys know, frequent listeners know, I love my neuroscience and talking about the nervous system. So I wonder if it would be helpful before mentioning signs, just speaking a little bit about what hap- what actually happens in the nervous system, like how does it get affected and why? Um, so just kind of thinking about the parent brain. So basically, has everyone heard about the hormone called oxytocin? When we become a parent, yes. we release that beautiful love hormone and that activate, activates reward pathways in the brain And when we have really positive, beautiful interactions with our children, um, we release dopamine and that oxytocin. And our brain, which is, you know, awesome, you know, muscle, it essentially tracks our experiences and builds automatic responses. So we learn to approach experiences, things, and relationships that have um, given us reward in the past. So if we felt good in something, we want to approach and have more of that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about parenting a kid who has got really exacerbated ADHD symptoms, and as you said, living in that prolonged stress, um, we're not getting the positive relational experiences. Majority of the time, we're having a really tough um, kind of negative experience, a less desirable parent-child interaction. And so instead of wanting to approach our kids, what happens in our nervous system is we actually start to anticipate the battles and the outbursts and we want to avoid that. And it kind of moves our nervous system into that fight, flight, or freeze stress responses. And you know, even for some, I've worked with many parents, Donna, who their nervous system gets to a point where they they actually experience their child as a threat. Um, Like the nervous system kind of goes, oh, especially those kids who are in that constant aggression um, and when things feel really, really big and tricky. And, yeah, so that kind of leads to some of those signs. If we're in the fight, flight, freeze, stress responses, like what does that look like? Yeah. Did you want to add anything to that before I? No, uh, no, I'm just like enthralled and, you know, I I love I love hearing you talk, so you can continue. Yeah, so it's like that parent-child reward system kind of crashes when we're in that ongoing, not very great interactions with our kiddos and we're not having enough positive interactions with them to keep that reward system going. So we're actually not getting the dopamine anymore. We're not getting the oxytocin. We are just in stress. So. And I will say I can totally relate to that one. Uh, I got to a point when my son was struggling and my family was struggling where I would say to my husband, I do not like my son. I don't like to be around him. And, you know, it got to a point where I just didn't want to be around him um, because he didn't provide me anything other than stress. Yeah, absolutely. And in the kind of therapeutic realm, we, um, I think it's Dan Hughes and John Balin who do, do a lot of work in parent-child relationship stuff. Um, they, they've kind of coined it as blocked care can happen. So we literally, it's like I said, we want to avoid 
that interaction and it kind of shuts down the part of our brain who wants to care for our kids. And it can be a really, um, a really sad and scary place for parents to, to get. And that's, um, because then it whips up guilt and a whole bunch of other stuff. Oh, I <laughs> see you. I mean, the guilt that came out, you know, I'd go to bed at night. Yeah. Like with this sense of guilt of the way that I was acting towards him. I'd I'd wake up in the morning dreading the interaction with him. I mean, you know, what kind of mum mm-hmm. says, I don't like my child? Yeah. So then it starts bringing up all those, yeah, the thoughts, the worries and the beliefs. And yeah, I guess it's kind of leading us to what are some of those signs that the nervous system is either overwhelmed or towards burnout. And I kind of like to tease out, there's a little bit of a difference between being in the overwhelm and then we're really in burnout, Um, where overwhelm is kind of like when we're being really flooded with emotions and stress. And you might notice Um, Parents might notice they are having a shorter fuse, less patience, more irritable, agitated, or the overwhelm has you zoning out more, really forgetful. Um, Basically noticing yourself becoming more reactive to things and you don't have managed, you know. And, And that's because when we're in that chronic stress environment, our window of stress tolerance gets smaller, like what we can manage shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And our nervous system seems to get really easily activated and triggered. Yeah. Because we just don't have much tolerance, just mm-hmm. kind of keep shrinking. Um, especially when we feel like we don't have the space to look after ourselves, which we'll get to. And um, a mentor of mine used to speak about the kind of the difference between being really emotional and triggered. And triggered and activated is when our response kind of is a little bit out of proportion to the situation. Like we get really, really activated. Yeah. And that's because our nervous system, and I've talked about this before for the children that we work with, but our nervous systems actually store all of our lived experiences Mm -hmm. over time. And it's holds onto the stored stress if we're not releasing it consciously and actively. And so when we feel a particular emotion or a thought gets triggered for us, our nervous system can react from a place of all the times we have ever had that thought or feeling. I don't know if that's making sense. And so it's like, if we feel anger, we feel like our child's not listening to us, our nervous system can react to all of the times we have felt not heard or not listened to. So it can be a bigger reaction. Yeah. So if you're, if you're, if your child just has, does something little, you might be overreacting because your nervous system is thinking about all those past experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's kind of being that sign of like, ooh, okay, I'm in overwhelm. I'm so agitated. I'm so irritable. Yeah, can't stand my kid or just don't want to be at home. Like, mm. um, you know, I know for myself in those periods of stress and overwhelm, I, I, I know it's a sign for me when I'm sitting in the car when I've already parked for an extra five minutes before I get in the house. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, wow, okay, I'm actually, you know, feeling overwhelmed. The story actually I remember one Mother's Day. Oh, it was a shocker. Uh, Is shocker an Australian word? I don't know. It probably probably is. It was a terrible Mother's Day. And I just remember saying to my husband, I'm done. I'm out of here. Like, this is not how I want to spend my Mother's Day. I'm out of here. I'm going out and having some dinner by myself. And I just knew I had to escape that situation because I was in that overwhelm. Yeah, yeah, that's the overwhelm. And that's, um, uh, you know, in some ways like a flight response, which I know we talk a lot about the stress responses in the nervous system being fight, flight, freeze, mm-hmm. bond, flop. Um, you know, where it can be helpful as parents for us to reflect on, are we someone who moves, who tends to, with lots of stress, move into fight mode, which is like the yeller, the outbursts of anger as a parent. I think on a coaching call yesterday, Don, I said, I'm a self-proclaimed yeller. Like that <laughs> is my default. Um, and then flight mode being the parent who is in that chronic, um, again, hyper arousal, rushing around, wanting to finish a million tasks, really unable to rest. I know there's parents out there, particular mamas, who find it hard to just 
rest for a mm-hmm. few minutes. It's like, oh, I've got to do this. Oh, I've got to do that. That can actually be a sign we're in flight mode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that freeze mode is literally just wanting to tap out. Like I'm done. I'm out. I need this to end. You know, maybe staring out into space, finding yourself daydreaming, low energy. Um, I don't know if we've talked about flop or fun before, but no, flop is like a crash. Yeah. So flop is when those first line of um, sympathetic nervous system defenses kind of fail over time, like fight, flight, freeze, just don't do it anymore. And the overwhelm pushes us into to burnout and crash. So the flop is where we just, we come crashing down and it's kind of an immobilized experience in the body. That's when we start to feel um, really exhausted emotionally, physically, mentally, um, I can just picture, you know, flopping onto the bed <laughs> and just being literally <laughs> exhausted, low motivation. And then emotionally, there can be feelings of hopelessness, despair. Um, it's kind of those lower, you know, energetic um, stuff happening in the body. And then fawn is a recently newish stress response that people have spoken about fawn is when um stress pushes us into wanting to please others and we kind of self-sacrifice our own needs so we stop looking at ourselves and inward and we kind of please others we do for others um you know that's the way we've we've kind of learned to manage stress as well Mm -hmm. and yeah so i guess if parents are noticing or even as you're reflecting and listening now it's like oh which one do we tend to go into some of us might fall into two you know I can move between fight and flight some of those signs I know is like hold on it's 10 o'clock at night why am I still writing a to-do list I think I'm in stress response or yeah feeling guilty for sitting for five minutes ah there it is you know so the more we can build our self-awareness and get to know what it looks like when we have our stress responses. Um, And it's, I'm really mindful of the risk of burnout and that chronic overwhelm for parents who are solo, single parents and single mums. They're often are holding the emotional domestic load on their own Um, or parent, you know, parents of partners, partners might travel a lot. And so they're, you know, or they don't have a lot of family and family support or social support. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally understand that. I really take my hat off to to solo parents uh because you know when you've got another human being you've got to look after and you don't have that support system around around them but I I really like I mean just this episode alone in laying out those different responses and then just reflecting on or even being aware of when you move to different responses and that self-awareness can be game changing in in its own right. And when you're like, Oh, okay, here I go. Fight mode. You know, I can just imagine what what's that? What's that? Um, that old, uh, 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 computer game, you know, the little man coming down and doing the kickboxing and (laughs) to try the fight mode. Uh, anyway, totally random sidestep there. But uh, when you're aware of it, you can take steps to rectify it. Absolutely. We can note, the more we're noticing what's happening in our minds, in our body, in our, yes, physiologically sensation, we start to get to know ourselves better, then we can, um, yeah, put in steps or get ourselves out of the dynamic sometimes. Or, yeah, just being aware means we can, hope you know start to slow it down before it really starts to impact on our mental health um as you said um because when we notice that our mental health is becoming impacted that's when we notice we're having those anxious thoughts depressed symptoms panic attacks and it's like okay we've actually gone too far down the continuum of stress and we're not okay and you know that's when i really encourage parents to seek you seek support outside of self as well you know whether that be um your naturopath your acupuncturist kinesiologist your doctor other health practitioners um a therapist uh you know going what That's are the harsh. ways that I can reduce? <laughs> yeah like how can I re- reduce stress right away and then also looking at um what's my sustainability plan here 
Mm-hmm. You know, what's the self care audit? Um, what's my well being plan? How am I going to sustain parenting um, in this way? Because it, yeah. it's actually not sustainable when your kid has exacerbated mm-hmm. symptom. Um, but we also know that we also can't soothe our kid's nervous system if our nervous system is totally shot. Oh, a hundred percent. Well, you just mentioned um, self care, so I think it's a it's a good segue to sort of discuss the importance of that, um, mm-hmm. especially you know for parents in in the context of raising a, a child with ADHD. Yeah, um, I mean it's it's vital, it's critical, <laughs> yeah. and I, I know we talk about this in many of our podcasts. Adana is um, we're we as parents, we're the container for our children's nervous system. We are their safe place to grow. And we know kids with ADHD, they need extra help and scaffolding to grow, to exercise the brain, to grow their executive functioning and their emotional regulation. And I, I mean, I've worked with, you know, hundreds of parents and have I've also seen the profoundly adverse impacts of living in chronic stress without support. Um, We know it manifests into inflammation, disease, lowered immunity. Um, You know, we talk about the mental and emotional health, but actually what stress does to the physical body um, can be pretty, pretty shocking as well. And and people people don't actually realise that or know that, but Mm. stress is the silent killer. It really is. It's probably one of the top things that cause disease along with poor diet, but let's not go there. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, yeah, Gabor Mate wrote that book, When the Body Says No, like when stress actually starts to manifest physically and when our body's like, no, the body sometimes will tell us you know, when we're not doing okay, like the panic attack. That was a sign of your body going, hello, I'm going to shut you down if you can't do Uh it for yourself, you know? Yeah. Um, You know, when we talk about us holding the keys to our children's nervous system and how stress can impact on us, but our family and our relationships and our parenting capacity, um, I know that that can sometimes trigger guilt for parents because it's like, oh, okay, now it's this vicious cycle and, who you know, sometimes parents will move into blaming themselves. Um, I know for myself when I was in a highly distressed spaces, I would think about how off, yeah, I would feel awful at how this may have impacted my kid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's very quite quick in society to blame ourselves as parents for everything that goes wrong. And one thing that um, really helped is remembering that, I'm doing the best I can with the resources I have. Yeah. And all I can do is gain more resources. And sometimes that takes time. Um, I've got uh, this parenting mentor I follow. She shared a quote from her teacher, um, Alka Analda. And it's this great quote I'm using a lot with our Thrive parents of, if you could be doing better, you would be. Mm-hmm. But when you can, you will. We're learning and growing alongside of our children. Oh, we so, are. And it's 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 like Ross's green, like kids do well when they can. And yeah. the same goes for us. Yeah. Same goes exactly. for us. Yeah. And if we could be doing better, we would be. And you're showing up, you know, you're listening to podcasts, you're, you know, gaining information. And the, the more we can build our resource, then, yeah, we will do better when we can. Mm-hmm. So giving ourselves a lot of um, grace and compassion is so key in this journey. Definitely, definitely. So do you have any sort of uh, tips around the self-care side of things for parents? I know, I mean, that's probably a whole separate topic for an, maybe we'll uh, we'll tackle that one next. But, uh, anything? Yeah, I definitely have some tips. I mean, definitely some things of the don'ts to do, the avoidant, the voids, yeah. the things to avoid um, because it's going to exacerbate or overwhelm. So you hear Donna talk about this a lot. If you can, avoid your inflammatory foods, you know. Um, Also avoiding caffeine, alcohol, too much sugar, which I know ironically as adults, it's sometimes the first thing we want when we're stressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We want Um, that dopamine, you know, that sugar. It it gives us that dopamine hit if we're not getting that from our child. Yeah, absolutely. So if we can decrease that, 
super helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, Trying to avoid too much TV and screen time because that's just a withdrawal as well. Like that's kind of just taking us out of our body. We know that kids do that a lot. It's like an auto-regulation. If you are in that heightened mode, if you know that you're someone who's in fight or flight and you're hyper, you're heightened in your stress, sometimes over-exercising or high-powered exercising, whilst it can release some really good hormones initially, it can keep us in the heightened state. Mm. So being really mindful of like, I know there's lots of parents who are like, yes, I went and did a massive run and I've been at the gym, but I might, but you spend your whole day really anxious. So when we're heightened, we actually want to down-regulate ourselves. Mm-hmm. And when we're feeling really burnt out, lethargic, low motivation, we want to up-regulate. So it's kind of a tip to be thinking about, again, as you expand your awareness on what your stress responses are, what symptoms are coming out for you, going, do I actually need to be energized or do I actually need to come down a bit? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so then choosing the kind of practices or self-care around that, yeah? And for those of you who do love the gym but are in that heightened state, you might do the high power but then also balance it with with something relaxing like a bit of yin yoga or stretching or, you know, breathing or so, a slow walk to yes. kind of bring our body back down. Um, yeah, so a few practices that can be helpful. Um, I talk about like sometimes even instead of self-care, slow care, like especially if you're someone who's heightened, like slowing things down where you can, yeah, or as I said, energizing practices if you're feeling low. So, you know, it can be, what's the one I've shared before, like where you, if you can in the moment, but even if you can't when you're really overwhelmed, is taking a big belly breath in and then doing a wiggle and you're actually shaking your whole body. So, and you might notice when you consciously move into breath, where your breath is, if it's like sitting up here, we know that we're probably a little bit stressed. Can you get it to your belly? It's okay if you can't, just noticing where the breath is. So yeah, doing that breath in and doing a wiggle. If you can do a breath in, a wiggle and smile, feels a little bit silly. Um, (laughs) That can like kind of be a little circuit breaker. Yeah. Um, and, and is that for that's for when you're in that heightened state? When you're in real overwhelm. Yeah. Even when we're low, overwhelm kind of sends us into zone out. If you're noticing that as well, you can do breath in. Um, when we're really heightened, we actually want to extend our exhale. When we're really low, we actually want to extend the inhale. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Listeners, go get a pen and paper. Just press pause. <laughs> okay, you've got that pen and paper. You're back. Unpause. What you want to write down. So can we just repeat that, please, Ashley? When we are heightened, we want to extend our exhale. And when we're really low, lethargic, we want to um, extend our inhale when you're doing that kind of conscious breath. And if you take, even if you do four breaths or three breaths, um, some other little micro body activities can be as simple as, um, s- just bringing conscious awareness and softening your brow, mm-hmm. your forehead going, Oh, where's my jaw? Unclench my jaw. You know, sometimes I do a little micro massage on my jaw and I'm like, Whoa, okay. Yep. We're sore. Um, even like shoulder rolls and neck rolls. So the back of the neck Um, is kind of connected to different parts of the nervous system that can bring on that parasympathetic nervous system, which is like the nice soothing one, Um, good for sleep. You know, sometimes you can get a little towel and roll it underneath your neck and lie down. So you have a bit of a um, arch there. I don't know if people know, but I think I was telling a parent the other day for a little kiddo to do it, put legs up the wall. So Mm -hmm. you're in kind of a 90 degree angle, legs up the wall, back kind of on the floor on the bed. That's, again, to kind of soothe. Um, And those, you can do that in a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes. And it's just that connect to body, connect to body, yeah. Some other ones um, that parents I've worked with and myself have found helpful is I invite parents to like, maybe with that pen and paper done, is writing down just five things that actually you enjoy. 
even tiny things. So for example, for myself, uh, coffee, my favorite podcast, uh, my favorite music album, getting outside to water the garden. And I like um, often diffusing essential oils. So they can be really tiny. Okay. Things. Actually, I just need to stop you there. So uh, the favorite podcast. Please say you. Oh, definitely the soaring child. (laughs) (laughs) I definitely have a few. And like, yeah, it just can be something that you just go, you know what? I'm just going to have my first sip of coffee and doing that with a bit of my mindfulness, you know, or a herbal tea, putting your favorite podcast on um, or my, you know, my favorite music when I'm doing a household chore because I love my multitasking. That's my flight mode. But, you know, sometimes it's doing it with the slowness and it's like, oh, I'm listening to something I enjoy whilst I'm doing something I have to do. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like building in rhythms throughout your day or your week, sprinkling it with the things that fill up your cup even a little bit. These are for really time poor parents. You know, I'm not saying, I mean, great. If you can get to the gym, get to a yoga class, go for a bushwalk. Awesome. But if that's not always practical, because often we wait to do our self-care. It's like, oh yeah, I'm going to do that. And then a month goes by and you're like, I haven't done it. So where can we sprinkle in the little tiny micro slow and self-care and savor it? Yeah. Um, If you can have one thing that you really look forward to um, during the week, like your favorite TV show. Yeah. Outdoor walk, brunch with a friend. So you can hang on to that. Great. Mm. Uh, It's kind of doing a bit of that combination, if that makes sense. Um, It also can be, um, I had a supervisor that always says when I'm working with family, they're really high stressed. And he's like, just tune down the stress in the house, get them to light a candle, put on soft music in the background. Um, diffuse essential oils. Don't even tell your kids you're doing it. Dim the lights. And we know, again, neurobiologically, that that can soothe everyone in the house. And you just kind of put it on, um, walk away. Um, Another one, I don't know if you've got any ideas, Tana, but, you know, it can be as simple as watching something or listening to something that makes you laugh. Like I, I sometimes say to parents, when's the last time? you genuinely have really laughed at something. Mm -hmm. And if you got to watch something to make you laugh, take that two minutes. Totally. Um, You know, we know laughing can just release so much good chemicals. Um, I feel like laughing right now. I can tell you, I was just, I was thinking into my mind the last time I was laughing and uh, which we, uh, me and my husband do laugh a lot together. um, And I was just about to burst out laughing, just thinking about the the last time I was laughing. So it does, it just releases all of that. It releases that stress, doesn't it? Actually, these tips have been gold because, you know, it's very easy for us to say, Oh, well, yeah, as you said, go to the gym every day, go for a walk every day. Sometimes that's not practical, but I love all these little micro tips because I think that, you know, as busy parents and parents that are under stress, they need these micro tips. So, guys, I'd listen to this episode again. I would write it all down and just start implementing it because I can tell you that we need to regulate our own nervous system to then be able to help our child because we hold the key to our child's nervous system. And so, I mean, Ashley, this has been so wonderful. Uh, I have loved every moment of this podcast and I just want to extend a huge thank you to you for joining me today and really just sharing every time your knowledge and your experience, uh, you know, with our listeners. Uh, Please tell uh, listeners where they can find more information about you. Yeah, so you can go online to www.info.adhdthriveinstitute.com backslash parenting ADHD. There you go. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure, Dana, you're going to drop that in the in the I show notes. Will. I will drop that in the show notes as well. Well, Ashley, thank you once again for joining me. Uh, listeners, I really hope this conversation, you know, about the complexities of parenting a child with ADHD has resonated with you, um, maybe even brought you 
a little bit more understanding and comfort in in your current day. Uh, Before we go, I just want to ask you one little thing, one little thing. Uh, If you found today's episode um, helpful, if it really spoke to you, I just want to ask if you would mind leaving a review on the podcast. It's really just a small little gesture, but honestly, it means so much more than that. Uh, Your reviews really help others, others that might be struggling and feeling alone in their ADHD journey. And I know that that's all I wanted was when I was going through this is to know that, you know, I wasn't alone. Um, they, they help those other people find us. Uh, and when you share how the podcast um, has impacted you, it's not just about that feedback. It's really a message that they're not alone, um, a way of reaching out to the others who are walking in a similar path and letting them know there is a space out there that they can feel heard and they can feel supported. So definitely please take a moment to leave your thoughts. Uh, tell us what you loved about it, what you'd like to hear more about it. Um, you know, every word really helps uh, strengthen this amazing community that we're all building together. Ashley, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Listeners, thank you for tuning into this week's episode of The Soaring Child. I'm Dana Kay, your ADHD health practitioner. Keep on thriving. Thank you for listening to The Soaring Child podcast today. To learn more about how to help your child with ADHD soar using natural strategies, visit our website at adhdthriveinstitute.com and follow us on social media at ADHD Thrive Institute.